yeah i mean i hope you know like one year from now when we look back at our channel it has got like it's like the most popular channel in town i mean after nickels <laughs> <laughs> how you need to be in the stock markets as a trader if you're the same way in your life outside it becomes very hard to maintain a relationship because you have to be emotionally dead to a large extent right we even have an internal project we call it phase 3 to figure out a pathway for the next generation we are the first generation for the next generation to slowly come in organically i regret not hiring earlier so it was such a stupid uh, miss from my side <laughs> uh but since we're talking about hiring uh, this is the first time i've ever hired in my life i have zero hiring experience so i think to begin with we're not overstaffed so we have uh, the number of people that are required to cater to whatever role that there is <laughs> so uh it's uh, 13 years of zero though uh you know we just turned 13 uh, on august 15 usually on our anniversary we send out uh, like a blog post we publish a blog uh, where we talk about business updates risks and all of that um so yeah so since now we figured that we missed on this whole video strategy i thought how not change that strategy by actually publishing our updates as a as a video instead of a blog post so uh so that's why we put out the ama you thought we'll ask you uh I will answer your questions. We got like the core team which matters uh, who can answer a lot of these questions that have come through. I mean, I have I don't know like 100 questions here which have been selected. Uh I don't know if we'll be able to go through everything, but uh take a shot, All right? And uh, so yeah, so I'll start with intros. Um Nikhil uh, and I know each other for like 37 years. Thirty <laughs> six. <laughs> <laughs> my birthday, not your birthday. Yeah. So apparently, uh, you know, my mom says he's around because I asked uh, for a brother. <laughs> you know. So, uh, but yeah, why don't you, Nikhil, uh, talk about? I thought you were going to. No, no. I mean, I, I, I'll give one line intro, and why don't you talk about what you do and. like just a uh, quick i mean nikhil is popular i mean i'm i'm a, i'm feeling a little nervous trying to host this <laughs> format with seeing nikhil you know like the podcast uh, guru right now so uh, so yeah but but quickly and apart from you hosting your brilliant podcast and running uh, investments at zerodha i mean like why don't you talk about a little about yourself i spend all my time investing uh, public markets and private markets i would say public markets 70 to 80% of my time and private markets 20% of my time uh, nobody really knows what will happen tomorrow uh, including myself but uh, you try and be the lesser fool in a world of fools <laughs> and i've been doing that for a long long time now i think 19 years of trading in one form or another and that continues yeah <clears throat> yeah just uh for context uh, i mean the way zeroda started was when i suddenly realized how good a trader nikhil is and uh, he's probably one of the best traders i have seen in my life has been killing it year on year for i don't know how many years now uh and i think he's like our vc actually because if not for him we would have been forced to uh raise money in the first 3 4 years and and maybe some of what zeroda stands for today wouldn't you know it would have been very hard to stand on that if if we had taken you know the same uh, path of raising as much money as possible and etc so yeah if yeah. i could clarify one thing i feel like uh, a lot of people when we talk about trading uh, they assume that by trading we mean taking 100 rupees and figuring it out figuring out how to make it 200 uh, we are not talking about that i think the key here is to remember if a bank gives you 6% 7% if the year ends up with a 14 15% kind of return that's a spectacular year of trading and investing uh most people fall prey to the uh, fallacy that you can double your money triple your money i think if you're looking to do that in the stock market from the very beginning it will not work so even if we talk about investing trading i think the expectations have to be set very differently Yeah I mean actually you know now that you said this uh <laughs> I think the business um ke is also run very similarly right as in uh we 
we i don't think we have ever started a year with a revenue target sales target anything right as in uh, you know since we talk about this quite a bit as in we get up and try to do something better and we we believe outcomes you know if something good has to happen it'll happen to you sure. and and i think it's very similar like you know now that nikhil said his investing trading right as in it's very similar like were you philosophically like this before zero i mean like were you chasing outcomes because I think a lot of people who are listening to this probably think of us as <clears> these guys who set goals and chase it down. Like, you know, there are money goals, uh, product. I mean, like some rupee material goal, but it isn't. I mean, Nikhil is not like that, Venus is not like that, Karthik is not like that. Uh, uh, but I, I've known them for much longer than you. So, so actually, you know, we had a small little office just down this road uh, on Banagata Road, and K was doing a startup along with uh, his uh, two other friends. Uh, and i don't know said uh, k uh, you know uh, abid who's uh, who was his co-founder at that time uh, and uh, dash they used to stay in this apartment and one of the days they walked out they saw zeroda's small little board and decided to walk in and the day they decided to walk in the day abid decided to walk in i was about I was walking out right and if it was maybe 5 minutes later i probably wouldn't have met abid <laughs> and maybe you know all of this wouldn't have happened you know in terms of all our tech and product uh, so yeah so uh, we met uh, sensible as a business you know which they were trying to do in the earlier avatar didn't fly uh, because of some regulatory issues and uh, yeah k then joined us as in uh, we somehow convinced him uh, that there is a problem to solve uh, a tech problem to solve in the industry so yeah so that's how uh, k joined us in uh, in 2000 12 well, 13 so yeah so okay now now that we have the context maybe some of your you know like what nikhil was saying like how how have you figured your life as such just a person hmm? looking for contentment in this fleeting moment in history that that's me all of us can really you, can you derive upon contentment in same mode so uh, nitin asked early his first question was what was i seeking i guess i was always seeking satisfaction and contentment with the stuff i do and the stuff i do it's always been tinkering with technology and that that started out really early for me so do you believe time, today that you will get contentment from the stuff you do you know i've started deriving some contentment already i knew you would ask that <laughs> <laughs> you let me here <laughs> yeah nikhil is like that podcast but this is not your podcast so. <laughs> So I was uh, even in uh, 2012 when I'd met Abid. He wanted to. He had this vision to build a super simple financial platform. I had zero connection with finance or capital markets, but I was super excited as a uh, young developer to build things in an arena where there was no technology. So for any spirited technologist or a techie, finding a green field to do new things is like a big deal. That's. that really comes down to you know personal satisfaction of that urge to constantly do new things that's how i ended up in capital markets without even realizing what i was getting into and then you know we met uh, 2012 13 what uh, we were trying to do with abid that didn't work out but by then i think i'd spend like 9 or 10 months understanding the landscape and understanding the seeing the absolute lack of technology technological innovation in the entire space and even the biggest players out there had no good products no good consumer technology nothing so i i got really excited to build stuff and solve uh, problems engineering problems product usability problems and that's what we've been doing for the last decade are you more content today than you were 5 years ago <laughs> <laughs> I actually you know I I had like a bunch of tough tough questions to ask I forgot asking you Kill. So in extension to that uh and I thought after like each one does intro I'll ask one tough question. Uh you know you are a believer that excessive consumerism is kind of hurting the planet. Right? And uh, it's sorry it's not my belief there's mountains of evidence. Yeah, sorry it is you know, I mean right uh and uh but on the one side you know you believe that and you have made so many sacrifices in your life you know like not having a deciding to not have a kid and etc but on the other side 
uh, you know, you're also building a platform for a, a stockbroker, which is at the forefront of capitalism, right? Uh, how do you, you know, how do you, how do you think about it? As in, uh, does it, like, uh, I know, I know, I, I kind of know the answer, but you know, maybe the rest haven't had the conversation. But I don't have a clear answer. I think to be human is to manage all these contradictions and paradoxes in your head and move forward. So I have a very pessimistic outlook when it comes to a lot of things, but I'm not a defeatist. I continue to do whatever I continue to do. But there are many ways of justifying this to myself. All the non-financial stuff that we do, the foundations that we run, I think those are doing really large amounts of meaningful work. And the stuff that we do in capital markets is helping run all of that. So that is a big solace. If we ha didn't have a pathway for that, I mean, maybe I would have given up a while. <laughs> I had like the tough question for you. So now that you're doing podcast for that. Um, podcast is one night a month. No, no, but the thing is, I know how much it will consume. <laughs> It consumes one night a month. No, I think it's more than one night. No, it takes... No, no, but no, no, not, not in terms of your production effort. I'm talking about... Uh, no, I'll tell you the problem, right? I think I'm sure Karthika and you are on social media. So it's very easy to get carried away by doing well, how many likes, how many retweets, how many... Like, is it... You know, like, how are you managing that? Because it's so, at least... You know, with a tweet, you know, it's like, you know, very low effort. So if it doesn't do well, it's okay, no big deal, right? I mean, you, you wanted to share something. But since you've put so much effort, and since you have set a high benchmark now in terms of getting a lot of activity on your podcast, um, doesn't, like, aren't you, like, you know, every time you're producing a new podcast, uh, is it, uh, I mean, doesn't it consume you? As in, doesn't it, like, don't you think of, oh, is, will it do well, will it not do well, you know? And and what if tomorrow, if it doesn't do as well, do you think you'll get carried away to change the format to please people? As in, like, because it's happened, right? I mean, it's happens to all of us. There are sometimes, you know, I say something on social media, I shouldn't have said it. You know, I say it only because I think it'll be engagement or something like that. Yeah, so podcasts take like 5% of my time. Uh, they are a dopamine hit, like everything else on social media. Uh, there are many problems with social media, uh, notwithstanding things like a negative feedback loop is what is playing out in most circles today. Uh, if you say something critical of anything or you even present data on a podcast which is critical of something, you tend to do better than saying positive things. I think that has to change. What I personally like about that particular part of my life is uh, it's not you were poor, you became rich, how did you do it? It's very subject oriented. Uh, so every month I get to research and learn about something new. Uh, for example, the next one I'm doing is on consumption. So then I, that would mean I have to look at uh, sales data of electronics, fashion industry, uh, how e-commerce platforms are doing. All the kind of research, which in turn will help me be a better investor in a way. And also talking to the kind of people who come on it is research in my own way. You know, it's uh, when you come and attend one, it feels like five hours spent recording something. To me, it feels like five hours spent learning about a topic that I want to learn about. Got it. <clears throat> like a crash course for you. <laughs> it is a crash course for me. Every month is a crash course on a different subject, which I want to either invest in or I want to learn more about. And from arguably the best teachers out there, one has at hand. Yeah. So, uh, Venu and, uh, you know, we were all staying in the same apartment. Uh, Venu and Nikhil are like six, seven years uh, younger to me. And... Uh, uh, in 2000... By, by the looks of it, I look older than both of you. What is it? We both have gotten fitter. Just need a shave. Huh? Just need you a just shave. need to trim your beard. Okay. Anyway, so, uh, Venu, uh, uh, so we stayed together until 2001 and two, and... Yeah, so uh, I, have a, I have an incident, I have a story to share. So extrapolating on how a random set of events lead to wherever we are, we keep discussing about the butterfly effect. Yeah. 
So I remember that the first day I met you and uh, I must have been about 15 or 16 and then we go to school. Uh, school is in VV Puram and then uh, dad drops me and then he goes off and then we get to hear the news that Rajkumar has been kidnapped. And uh, there's a lot of galata and then they say, you know, schools are shut down. Incidentally, I happen to have a friend who stayed in the same apartment that you were and this was very close to the school. So he said, hey, why don't you just come along, you know, there's going to be a lot of nuisance around. So uh, I get into the apartment, that's, that's the first day I uh, <laughs> met you. Mm. And then I think ab about two or three years later, I moved into the apartment and then I got to know you. So wow. it's just been so random. <laughs> You yeah. want to talk so, about the horror stories on the terrace about devils? No, no, it was it was Nikhil. He would come up with, he would do the weirdest things. He looks so sophisticated now, but if you hear, <laughs> his, if you hear his antiques back in the day, I mean, it scared Venus so much one day, like, but making up stories about a devil which used to haunt a certain portion of our apartment complex. Yeah. <laughs> no, but but uh, you know, uh, Venu, uh, I think reached out in two thousand six. Yeah, two thousand six. Yeah, and uh, you know, we were that time sub brokers in uh, in Reliance Money, and Venu reached out. Uh, you reached out and you said you want to join. I mean, I mean, we know some of us have spoken about it, but it's still you know interesting to know why would you want to leave a job at at HP and and come join so, some. As I don't know, well. like, you know, like someone who can't even make the payroll, maybe, you know, like, you know, so. So, so I took a pay cut. Uh, so I passed out in 2006 uh, and I was pursuing my chartered accountancy. And then I was somehow very reluctant to work under a practicing chartered accountant. So I said, I'll join uh, HP. HP seemed like a dream job back in the day. But somehow it didn't, I, I didn't see myself fit into that culture, although I worked there only for about two, three months. And uh, my childhood, from the time I've been a kid, uh, I've had a very sheltered and a very protected kind of uh, childhood. I've not explored a lot of things. I've been very guarded in the way, way uh, you know, I've led my life. So I think when, when, you, when you are brought up that way, I think a small amount of rebellious nature that sort of creeps into you saying, I don't want to do the ordinary, I want to do something that no one else is doing. Uh, so that is what I think... Uh, persuaded me and I think there was a there's a first impression right as I said when I met you you were the school cool dude in the apartment right <laughs> uh, a lot of people looking up to you so this was not in context of uh, uh, your business skills or your acumen whatsoever I mean you was just the kid who had a cool car you're the first guy who I knew who had a mobile phone so you just had a tendency to look at someone and, and think you know this guy is so cool so uh, I think when I quit HP and then I connected with you uh, money is not something that I've really cared for. You asked Kia a question on uh, whether whether you uh, ever thought of outcomes, right? Uh, I, I stayed with my dad, I mean, with my family. And then once my dad moved to London uh, to service Canada Bank, I stayed with my grandfather and I've, I've had a very close, I've looked at him very closely. So he runs a very uh, shameless plug. He runs a very popular restaurant in Bangalore. <laughs> So I've seen his work ethic. It's, it's, called, it's called it's called Dwarka. It's called Dwarka. <laughs> <laughs> so so the plugs come turned in. 50 years <laughs> this year. So I've seen his work ethic um, at a time when he could just sit at home and and not do anything. At the age of 80, he would wake up at 5:30 in the morning and uh, and go to the restaurant, uh, cook dishes himself. Because he had an intent to serve his customers. So, so outcome is never something that I've wanted to look at. Uh, mm -hmm. You just follow the course and you let everything uh, happen. Yeah. So, so just, the, just the rebellious nature coupled uh, with the fact that, you know, the association was nice is why I... So, yeah, so I mean, we knew heads, operations, everything that happens in compliance and ops is, uh, is what we know takes care of. Uh, we know one tough question. Why, why so shy? <laughs> you know, in the sense, you know, I don't know. I think you're probably the most. You know, you, you, you've been saying that you've been nervous. I mean, yeah, I, I, I've been brought up as an introvert, so I, I haven't had uh, 
I think it's just the nature. I, I've not been exposed to as many people growing up. I haven't done as many things. No, but but I have a question. Up. Now that you know, we want to have like all new video strategy of zero the, the operations wise, you probably know better than anyone else. Also, and you look the good. Best, best looking amongst yeah, them. Yeah, you're the best. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that wasn't me. <laughs> In yeah. an alternate universe, <laughs> so you know which one I'm talking about. <laughs> So what, uh, how about, uh, you know, you looking at you know, producing some no, I think I personally, I feel I perform best under anonymity, which is why even though I'm on social <laughs> media, I'm not on social media as myself. So I, so I know what's happening, <laughs> Actually, but I you prefer know, to stay. Uh, yeah, one of the anecdotes, you know, like the first year of Zero, the first one, two, three years, Venu used to call himself Bharat, I used to call myself Sachin, you know, while dealing with the <laughs> customers because he was the chief compliance officer and I was the, whatever, CEO. And when we were interacting on online forums, he would respond as Bharat and I would respond as Sachin. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so, uh, Karthik, a uh, master of uh, uh, education. Guruji. Uh, Guruji, yeah. So, uh, Karthik uh, was a customer uh, yeah. before anything happened. So, I... I remember going and selling him a, a CFD account yeah. you know, when I was a sub broker. With Reliance money. With Reliance money, yeah. So this uh, was like 2006, six, seven. Yeah, around yeah. six. And then Karthik went, did his masters, came back, tried to do a business, and then, uh, you know, he was always passionate about education. I think you, you've been, I don't know, running courses, going to colleges and teaching from forever. Yeah. And uh, I remember, you know, discussing with the rest, uh, rest three of, you know, like uh, saying that, you know, we need to build education and how you're the right person. And uh, it's a bet that's paid off beautifully for the business because I think Varsity is, I think, by far the best uh, education platform in this country. And you built it all alone. It's just quite crazy. A lot of people don't believe that one person has built the entire Varsity content and one person has answered all the queries in that, and you know, I don't know how many thousands of queries, right? So, lakhs. Uh, la yeah, lakhs of queries actually, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, uh, some, why don't you quickly set a contra uh, so, intro? I was not always passionate about education. <laughs> <laughs> actually, yeah, let me, let me, the funny bit is, uh, Karthik, uh, I mean, it's actually, it's not funny. It's actually, like, I, I keep talking to Karthik every time, you know, we go out. I'm saying, I, I don't know how, how many people have gone back to college and actually <laughs> finished <laughs> their engineering over. So yeah. you had how many carry you said at the end of uh, four years? The entire engineering. <laughs> <laughs> so, so at the I'm end of four a years. Student. At the end of four years of engineering, Karthik had a lot of subjects to complete and you yeah. know he went back and completed it because most people I know give up yeah. like uh, no one goes back to college and actually completes yeah. if you have like some, tons of subjects carried over yeah, yeah. but yeah please sorry so it's, I it's think very... Karthik was forced to complete because he wouldn't got, he wouldn't have gotten to marry no I got married and then I was forced yeah. to complete <laughs> <laughs> so yeah but it's very funny it's a, it's not like I was uh, a very good student nor was I passionate about teaching. And when I look at it, uh, you know, in retrospect, I don't know how this happened. Yeah. So, uh, but but when I started Prakar Capital, uh, you know, with Prakash, and uh, we were, our objective was to manage money, right? But then money management, you know, it's a, it doesn't pay you off immediately. And I had bills to pay. And uh, Ashwini was like, why don't you at least go teach in a college? <laughs> yes. And, you know, you'll have some income coming your way. So I was forced to take it up. And then, you know, Manipal and NSE, they had this uh, workshops going on in Bangalore. And I was like, if this is happening in Bangalore and if I'm not doing this, then what's the point? So I just walked into Manipal's office and, you know, like a cold walk and sold them the idea that, I'm the one they should enroll to deliver these programs in in, in Bangalore and rest of uh, Karnataka. So through those workshops, I actually developed a liking for teaching, but it was never my you know oh, first preference. Yeah. So, but then yeah, I'm so glad I did that because it turned out really well in terms of uh, contentment that you spoke about. Uh, mm -hmm. I think this is a very satisfying uh, you know yeah. job to do. I think Venus' grand, grandfather's story, that was also about contentment. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, the question for you, you know, which we've been fooling around in our group, which is, do you think your body transformation <laughs> has helped you become intellectually uh, <laughs> like superior, like just, just for context? Mm. Karthik was heavy, you know, he was, he was big, you know, big Tucking guy. in my stomach, <laughs> say that. And then, you know, Karthik started working out, uh, built confidence, I think, because then he got in front of camera, Karthik is making varsity videos, uh, and, and then he took photography as a hobby. Yeah. Uh, and then he's just a different person, you know, like, uh, Kay and I keep talking about it, like, you become like a stud now, as in, <laughs> you crack funny jokes, you know, you're like, you know, you make friends, you network, you're like a different person compared to what you were five, six years. Do, is this, do, do you believe it all started with your body transformation or? I don't know, I, I really don't know the answer, but uh, but we maybe know. it's, we know. you've dissected <laughs> this like, like, like the way he says. I've dissected your life like a cockroach. <laughs> when this is being played out, can we do that before or after? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Can. We'll do that in yeah. post. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but I, huh? yeah, but I don't know the, uh, the answer. Right. Um, so, yeah, so I, uh, you know, I have like a bunch of questions now to get through. Uh, I think uh, some questions around how was the year, you know, for us and this anyways, I'll update it in a blog post, but uh, I think uh, the year has, for all stockbrokers, I think 2020 onwards have been almost stupid type of years. It's, you know, it's just that new business is happening at a, at a really fast state. It isn't, I mean, we've done our things, but I think the market itself is growing so fast. And uh, so yeah, so broker, I mean, we have done well uh, in terms of financials. Uh, We'll share the financials in the in the blog post. Um, uh, I, I wanted to actually pick up one thing, which is also in some of these questions. Uh, hits and misses, you know, if for each one of us. Uh, you know, if you look at the last one, one and a half years of our business, uh, what is like a hit, what is a miss? Uh, maybe Karthik, we can start from you. And so like, I, uh, I think the biggest miss for us has been the video, uh, you know, content. And we've started plugging that in uh, slowly. But I think there's a lot more to do. Uh, so that for me is the biggest miss. Uh, hopefully and, and by hit, next year, this time, we should have plugged that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I hope, you know, like one year from now, when we look back at our channel. Exactly, yeah. It has got like, <laughs> yeah. it's like the most popular <laughs> channel in time. I, yeah. I mean, after Nikhil's. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, but, but in terms of hits? Uh, I can... Let me talk about Varsity. I think uh, the idea, conceptualizing the idea of Varsity and Varsity Junior and bringing it to life, I think is a very good hit for Varsity as such. So I think while business been booming since 2019, uh, regulation wise has been extremely demanding. So I think the amount of regulatory changes that we've seen in the last three years is probably five times the number of regulatory changes in the first eight, nine years of our business. So I was, I was telling this to someone, uh, just staying abreast and uh, staying compliant with the constant regulatory changes, I think is a big hit for us because A, for the, for the size that we are, it's not like I can put all the data on in an Excel and figure out, you know, if, if all the values are matching or not. And th there are short timelines and for a size like ours, the fact that we use an in-house back office, because if you use a vendor back office, there's info flowing in from different uh, brokers. So the, the vendor, it, the, the onus is on the vendor to deliver compliance for you. But, but here, we'll have to understand the regulation, discuss it internally uh, with the tech team who've gotten beautiful at understanding uh, the financial and the compliance uh, angles. So I think delivering on uh, the, the compliance objectives has been a big hit uh, for us. What have been misses? There have been a few products which, uh, which we've been discussing internally, which uh, if we had in place, I think would have been in a better place, but yeah, we're working on them too deliver uh, it to our clients at the earliest. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we, sometimes we have big breakthroughs. Products that we see on the outside, technology that we only see the inside. So there have been numerous small wins. We, small wins all add up. 
I think miss-wise, I wouldn't say we really missed out on anything uh, when it comes to tech, engineering, etc. But uh, work from home has been uh, a, a tough nut to crack. Uh, so we decided to, we went full remote in 2020, right? Uh, yeah. 2020, 2020 COVID. And because the, the for the first year, year and a half, because we were all confined, uh, we were all glued to our screens, everything just happened. And then, and that's that's working in a, so wartime work is always very different from peacetime work. And we were all scrambling to make it, make stuff work. But over the last year, year and a half, I've found that remote work in our small team, which depends entirely on mutual trust, communication, and collaboration. It's been quite detrimental. Uh, people who sat together and worked side by side for eight years, you know, over the course of a few months, they've kind of drifted apart. Many people, uh, we have a tiny tech team, uh, of which only, let's say, 10% communicate actively on online platforms because it also requires proficiency in English. So these are things that we don't really think about when we speak of remote work. Uh, I have, the traditional remote work, tech stuff, white collar stuff, I think it's difficult in India compared to, let's say, our Western counterparts, firstly because of the language barrier. So I think we l missed out on what could have been a lot more incremental breakthroughs. And as you know, we've started coming back to the office and just over the last four weeks, the number of things that were pending that have just been done just like that, you know, people sitting next to each other and chatting. So that bugs me that we maybe missed out, but I don't think it was a failure. It's just, that's what happened. And it was in nobody's hands. It's yeah. only that. I think one of the best things about all of us is we're all friends first before we're colleagues. Like he, so arc, he articulated it so well, you know, neighbor, friend, friend, friend. I think we all look upon each other first as a friend mm -hmm. and then as somebody who works with each other. If yeah. sharing this bond, we are not more critical of each other and we kind of like second whatever one or the other person is thinking, <laughs> we'll be doing the group a disservice more than anything. Because we have this bond, it would be easier to be critical unlike most other companies are. I'm your most vocal critic. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I don't like my criticism. He has I mean, criticism to every tiny facet of my life. See? No, no, I mean, like, that's what you want. I mean, I have, I have a K filter in my life. You know, like before I do anything, I will like watch. Like, this, this last part was to Karthik and Venu. Yeah. yeah. No, no, Karthik and Venu are a little shy, you know, but uh, but I think yeah. if there was a time to uh, express, they would express now. Yeah. yeah. Just not over chat. I think chat is like, really this is for them. You don't need to be any more critical. Than you are. <laughs> I can't take it. I'll jump on. But honestly, this is uh, one of the biggest downsides of work has been the loss of emotion, nuance, and depth in communication. One line English chat sentences. Mm -hmm. It's just been very detrimental to all of this because you might. It's so easy to misinterpret an English word be it uh, in support, be it a piece of criticism, it has happened at scale. So Venu, now, I think the, the one of the, I think the issues with the operations, right, not just at Zeroda, but across all businesses, it, it becomes repetitive. Some of these tasks become repetitive. How do you, how do you keep people motivated? Right, you know, like, because one slip can cause a lot of damage, but, it's, but the, the work in itself is a very repetitive, you know, like keep repeating. Uh, how do you how do you think about it when you're so so contrary to what we believe? While at the user side of things, things may not have changed, but at the process side of things, I think everything has changed. I mean, a lot of changes keep happening. For example, uh, the way a client transfers funds, right? I mean, from the user's perspective, it's just the user logging onto the app and initiating a transfer. But we know that. And there's a small funds team looking after this process. So uh, internally, over the past few years, there have always been constant changes. So we've tried to figure how do we better this. So we've gone on from getting all payments routed from one payment gateway to having direct integrations with each of these banks, uh, having backups for UPI. 
for example, on the payout side of things, uh, earlier, if a client requested for a certain amount of payout, which did, he did not have, uh, we would simply reject the request. And then based on user feedback, we now process payout for whatever is available uh, in the user's account. So while it may not come across as a dramatic change, uh, I think there's a lot of work that keeps happening. So it's, it's, it's never been status quo, uh, at least from the process side of things. And this is true to most processes. You take uh, funds, you take DP, you take partner, uh, the kind of regulatory changes that, that have happened in the, reg in, in the space of uh, partners and authorized persons. So the team has always been on the guard. So they've, been, they've found, a, they found newer things to do. So some processes have gotten monotonous, but but that's just the way that it is. So we've, uh, if we found someone suitable, we've graduated them into doing uh, more efficient things while, uh, you know, automating certain things. And and there has, you know, like on this attrition question, there are, you know, we have, on the off side also, we have hardly lost anyone. And why, why, why are, I mean, is it, if not, what, do, what do you think, you know, why, what's the reason, uh, so I think it's the culture of the people who we've hired. Uh, all of them, I mean, I was having a meeting with all of them a couple of days back. And everyone who leads a process team today has been with us for 10 years. I mean, we gave out those gold coins a couple of couple of days back. I think 40% of the people who we gave out uh, were people from the process team. So I think uh, from where they started to where they find themselves today, uh, there's a lot of contentment. Uh, and, and these are people who've come through word of mouth. So they don't look at Zeroda as just another place to work. So they identify and they find themselves to be a part of the organization, which is... which is In this conversation, when you guys were having, uh, this, didn't this come up as in saying that, like maybe the reason they identify with the organization is also got to do with everything that we do as a business and not just... Uh, it, it didn't. It didn't go. It didn't go that deep. Yeah. Because because I know none of the boys or or girls on the team do anything with the intent of making more money. Uh, you know, or, or, there have been days when, uh, unfortunately, they've had to spend sleepless nights uh, having to run a certain process, and they do it with absolutely no expectations. So I think it's just that uh, bond that they've built with the organization, thanks to everything that we do. Is why I think uh, I, I think the the notion of doing good to the customer has penetrated deep in the organization. So yeah. actually, there was there were a bunch of questions around hiring, Key, and I think your you know your outlook, you know the way you hire, I think it's influenced like you know because before you, I also had this whole habit of thinking that people will solve problems and just go hire as many people as possible, and the way you hire is, is something that a lot of people, you know, outside also ask. Like, how do you ensure, how do you hire on the tech team? How do you retain them? How do you keep them motivated? You know, in a world, especially in 21, 22, where, you know, like there were so many people trying to attract, you know, good tech folks, right? Maybe uh, right from, you know, the giving, asking for a hobby project, right, during hiring, you know, maybe from there, you know, if you could just, uh, because there were two, three questions, you know, two, three people who had asked on our hiring. Uh, words like retain, keep them, etc. Don't. I don't see it that way. Uh, you don't retain talent, retain people. You are with people, and people who are creative, people, software developers, engineers have to be creative. People who are creative, who have that urge to build things, there, it's a certain, it's a certain kind of a mental model. Like I said, if I'm unable to work on many projects uh, altogether, things that interest me, I'd never be able to, you know, just do one thing. It's very monotonous. So everybody we've hired, and 95% of the team, uh, our small tech team, They've come with zero industry experience, like zero right out of college typically, maybe not even college. But they've most of them have been people who've tinkered around, people who, you know, built hobby projects, etc. So that's a certain archetype. People who do technology because you know, they like doing technology. 
And tech skills is one thing, uh, but maybe slightly more important than tech skills is really the philosophy of life in general. You can't hundred percent nail with nail it with every person, uh, every person. But when we, whenever we interviewed uh, folks for the tech team, we've never really grilled people on their tech skills because most of them have come in as really young folks, right? But I've really not grilled, had deep, candid conversations, long conversations about life, aspirations, what they like, what they don't like, what why they don't like a certain thing, just general life philosophies, and. That's that acts as a big filter, and people with the right atti- aptitude for learning, they can pick up tech skills in no time. Uh, some somebody comes in as a Python programmer, three months later they are proficient in Go, working on critical systems. That's not a problem. But if somebody comes in with the wrong expectations, career growth in a conventional sense, or designations, level one, level two, level three, we, we don't have any of those, or uh, certain any sort of material metric that's not really compatible with the way we are or the way we work. And also, I lay bare everything about us uh, on, on really at the first meeting, that 80% of the work will be really boring, uh, 20% of the time we may get to work on very interesting things, and this is what we do, this is who we are. No selling dreams when hiring, <laughs> just be realistic. So the people who remain after that are the people who have a much higher likelihood of, you know, being true to uh, these causes. And that's what's worked, just very transparent, open conversation. So I I don't, uh, the tech team, I, I see everyone as my peer, contemporaries, but not as talent that we retain or people to shuffle around or extract 100% efficiency and commitment from all the time. <laughs> so I don't have an investor's outlook. I refuse to have that outlook. But this is the way it has worked. And like I said, the only reason why we are at the way we are today is because of all of this. Yeah. Actually, uh, uh, you know, there's a question. I mean, it keeps, you know, different people keep asking me anyway. So, like, you know, if there's a young kid out there who is trying to build a career as a programmer, like a developer, what what should he do? As in, what I mean, like, what would he advise? Like, a, because programming is like the cool thing to do today, right? Isn't like people, you know, everyone wants to become a software developer, a programmer. Uh, what is what is your advice? I mean, if you could say in one or two lines, and go. every decent programmer is self-taught. This is a global thing. It's been like that for the last fifty years. You can't go to a college uh, or a boot camp and become a good programmer. You just get started. So. The only way to become a decent programmer is to write software, build technologies, and gain that experience hands-on. So, what the only advice I have for aspiring techies is to build tech. You have to you have to experiment to learn, and it takes a long time to gain experience and depth uh, and nuance, which is required for building anything that is reasonably complex. So, you just have to build, build at hobby projects or volunteer building stuff. There's no there are no shortcuts whatsoever. You are. Hmm. Actually, again, like a outsider shoes. Uh, you know, this whole philosophy with which we hire, we've been building business. I mean, Karthik, after I don't know, like ten years, finally <laughs> decided to hire. But Karthik, why didn't you hire all this while for varsity? I mean, it's just ridiculous that you, yeah, you decided very, to build. I keep, huh? Now that I've hired, and now that I'm seeing so much more being done, right. I regret not hiring earlier. So right. it was such a stupid. Uh, <laughs> Miss from my side, <laughs> uh, but right. since we're talking about hiring, uh, this is the first time I've ever hired in my life. <laughs> I have zero hiring experience. Right. But but you you put together a phenomenal team yeah, right now. Yeah, so yeah. I just went. So I didn't have a like like Kay mentioned his philosophy on hiring. I I, I don't have that yet. So uh, I just went with my gut feel whether that is the philosophy. Yeah, whether these guys that I'm hiring will fit within the larger company ethos and whether I'll be comfortable working with them. Those mm-hmm. were the only two parameters that I was constantly evaluating. And of course, whether they are able to understand markets and put out relevant content out there. So, yeah. and that, that is our hiring philosophy, Absolutely. really. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think this whole uh, not setting the right expectations is a problem while hiring also, right? I mean, yeah. I think yeah. when I see, you know, people quitting jobs, I think the biggest reason is because they were disappointed with 
you know, what was sold to them is the job. This is a question a lot of people have asked around trading and investing. How do I get better as a trader? I think one of the things right at the start you said was setting the expectation right. Mm. But I remember, you know, uh, long back, uh, this was in 2007-8, Rakhish uh, Junjunwala, the late Rakhish Junjunwala was in, uh, was in Nimans uh, in Bangalore uh, doing a talk. And he spoke almost very similar, which he said, you should expect 10 to 15% return from the markets. Mm. I raised my hands mm. and I asked him, mm. no. And he said, don't leverage, don't, mm. you know, like be content with 10 to 15%. And I raised my hands and asked, did you reach here in life without taking leverage and, you know, without... No, of course not. But yeah. I think every era is different. Uh, when I began trading, right, like, when I was 17 and I had that Sher Khan account. Yeah. This is a long time ago now because I'm 36. And in the 19 years that I have been trading full time, uh, A, it takes a lot of work. I think nobody should arrive here thinking trading is like this pastime you will do once in a while. Uh, I've had like <laughs> five days off in this 19 year phase where I've been in the hospital. If not for that, if I'm traveling, if I'm at home, whatever I'm doing, if the market is open, I'm on my terminals, I'm trading. Yeah. And, and markets, for the lack of a better way of putting it, are like a relation. It's like a relationship. It's like being married to a woman, right? Like, uh, not that I know a lot about it. <laughs> 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 on, on that note, I think it's a waste going on a holiday with him because he is in the room trading all the time. <laughs> but it, A, it's a lot of work. B, I think you have to... Uh, the problem about not having a relationship and this are correlated mm -hmm. because how you need to be in the stock markets as a trader, if you're the same way in your life outside, it becomes very hard to maintain a relationship because you have to be emotionally dead to a large extent, right? You can't, <laughs> you can't react That's to the deep. ups. <laughs> That's deep. But it'll drive away people from the markets. <laughs> but that's actually true. Like, I know a lot of traders, and uh, if you're somebody who gets carried away by near-term events in life, right? Like, or if you equate near-term goals in life to the money you will derive from trading. These are all like red ticks. If you do things like that, the odds of you being successful as a trader are lower. And for leverage and risk, like the initial question was, when I was 17 and I had 10,000 rupees to trade with, I took all the risk in the world, right? Like I borrowed as much as the broker would give me. I bought <laughs> as far away out of the money options as <laughs> the exchange would allow me. But I will say this with Every passing year, my ability to take risk has gone down. Uh, it's, I think it's just an emotional thing. Uh, and every year, I feel I'm closer to burning out than I was the previous year. Hence, I spend so much time uh, trying to build different things outside of myself as an individual. Uh, because that day will come. And I think... Uh, Hopefully that day comes before, you know, you fall off the cliff from a trading <laughs> standpoint and but, I make that choice voluntarily. But also a quick note, you know, because a lot of our customers mm. assume that they can trade for a living mm. with very small amounts of money. Right? As in, what do you think, like, you know, if someone wants to, if, if someone wants to lead a life from trading, what mm. should be like a minimum capital, you think? I think... If you can factor in 15% a year and you can live on that, I think you should attempt it. So even if someone is a full-time trader, you would say aim for 15% and... Yeah, I think if if you have 1 crore rupees to trade or invest and 15 lakhs a year or 1.2 lakhs a month is enough for you to survive, maybe you can attempt. Sure. But I have I think, a huh? different point to that. Yeah. I think... And it's not steady. Yeah, it's not steady. So I think it's very important to have a non-volatile source of income and uh, and not really depend on market for a living. I think it's a very, very tough nut to crack. And for most people, at least mo most people watching this, uh, I don't know if that's a yeah. thing we should be... No, I mean, there's something yeah. that 
I think we've all said it in different forums. Yeah. Uh, Trading for a living seems like an easy way of making yeah. money, but it's really the toughest way in life to make easy exactly. money. I'll, I'll digress a little bit. I'm reading this book now called Axioms. So, like, Swiss, Switzerland is in the middle of nowhere, right? They really don't have many natural resources. Uh, the reason they became what they are is they have such a large speculative appetite, and that is ingrained in their kids from, from the very beginning. Uh, like we are probably thought about cricket. They're mm. thought about the perils of speculation and the gains of it. Uh, their school of thought very much is the opposite of the school of thought you would have learned up until now in, in popular culture. You know, things like you should diversify, you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket, you should have a stop loss. Uh, the way they look at speculation is if a bet is not meaningful enough where losing that bet will hurt you emotionally, financially, mm -hmm. personally, whatever. You should not be taking such a small bet. You should be taking bigger mm -hmm. bets. Uh, so whenever you, whenever as a trader, you hear these things like, you know, do A, B, C, D, E and the odds go up. Mm -hmm. uh, what you have to remember is A, B, C, D and E are different for every in individual. Like what works for me will not work for you and will not work for Venu and Kailash and Nitin. Uh, so trading is more about discovering who you are rather than trying to mimic what worked for someone else because a completely different kind of thing will work for each person. But in this particular context, the Switzerland context you spoke about, that also implies there is societal and cultural support hmm. if it doesn't yeah. work. So which is very, very important. Yeah. If, here in India, if someone takes up trading for a living and uh, fails, the emotional trauma that the person will go through mm. and the lack of cultural support, societal support, mm. I think that's a bigger... I think that's changing in society. From when, from when I began trading 19 years ago, back then it was Jua, right? Like gambling. Right now, so many people have built a career around stock markets and the financial ecosystem in India. I think organically that narrative is changing in society. No, I think, I think you know, whatever we are doing as Aroda has also probably added to it. Right? Exactly what I wanted to ask. Yeah. Do you think yeah. you've yeah. influenced like, you know, that your, narrative? Your, yeah. you know, your influence, for example, as a trader could potentially be influencing. Yeah. No, I think, I think like a disclaimer, you know, like all of us, we've constantly been saying what Nikhil said, trading is hard. Uh, not everyone can trade. Trading is a skill set you're, you know, in a way you're born with, you know, messy. If he's not, I mean, he can't, I think, go play basketball for a living. You know? Like, you know, you need to figure what Nikhil said, uh, what you're good at. And and also, I think a lot of people mistake that trading is just trading stocks. I think trading is, you know, uh, like we said before, trading is trading your time to do what you can get the max outcome on your time. Right? You know, if I'm a good stock broker, I should go build a broking firm. Nikhil is a good trader, you should go build, be trading. If K is good technology, he could products, education, operation, all of this. You know? So I think in our lives, it's the idea is to figure what we're good at. And but we would also be so hypocritical if we spoke badly against trading. So let me say this. Unlike most professions out there, uh, it is that one place where no two days are the same. You go to work yeah. every day. Yeah. The most boring jobs in the world are repetitive. They say librarians have the most stressful jobs ever. The, the great thing about trading is every day is so new. Yep. And the day you think you know what will happen tomorrow is when it's the last day for you. Right, yeah. Interesting. Got it. Okay, so, uh, okay. Um, I've I got questions for you now. Okay. Mm, so this is like a technical question. Um, uh, uh, on ERP next and every, like, you know, like, like all the all our tech stack, you know what what is behind zero? That what powers us? You know maybe like a like a quick like what is the stack at zero? Uh, we we built everything up from uh, the bare bones using first principles, using open source tools, and some of the open source bets that we took ten years ago, uh, those critical decisions are still. Uh, still paying off so we're going to so we have a tech blog where we talk about all of this in detail but i'd say that every single thing that we use inside zero be it uh, 
द बैक एंड बैक बोन ऑफ काइटा इन्वेस्टमेंट एंड ट्रेडिंग प्लेटफॉर्म और बीट आर एम्प्लॉई लीव एप्लीकेशन पोर्टल इंट्रानेट सपोर्ट टिकटिंग सिस्टम एब्सोलूटली सिंगल थिंग सेल्फ होस्टेड ओपन सोर्स सिस्टम्स एंड दिस इज वेरी पॉपुलर अर्बन मिथ दैट यू शुड ओनली फोकस एंड स्पेंड टाइम ऑन वॉट इज कोर टू योर बिस्टम वन कैन आस्क your intranet employee intranet is not core to your business the support ticketing system is not exactly core you'd rather just offload that to saas but the reality is that as a business as an organization grows all of these things really become core to the business today how we answer support tickets how we answer uh, support calls etc are so critical and core to us if we didn't own that piece and if we hadn't taken that decision 9 years ago you know it wouldn't be ideal so people really have to think of 10 years ahead when setting up these technologies so the entire stack is composed of widely popular widely available open source uh, technologies and we're going to we are in fact working on a full exhaustive list of every single open source piece that we use and we're going to publish it on our website it's just a side project we've been doing nice also you know uh, i think like Uh, something that people don't appreciate as much about zeroda i think is how you scaled well right because uh, in a low cost pricing model like ours yeah to be able to do well as a business financially you need to be able to scale right as in because we are doing 10 to 20 million orders a day is why our revenue profitability show as much but it's almost like really hard to be able to get to 10 to 20 million orders a day unless your your tech is in place Yep. Right, unless uh, you know our business and ops is in place, right? And like, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that we've gone from one million customers to twelve million customers with eleven hundred people on the team. Yeah, tech team has probably gone from twenty-seven to thirty, right? Twenty-nine to thirty, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, twenty-nine to thirty. Our infra costs. have not gone up at all i know our, yeah. you know like the aws bills the i mean it's 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 kind of uh, ridiculous so how much you know like sometimes when you know when i look at our financials and look at costs i wonder how the tech hasn't the tech costs you know how how, how have we been able to is it is it a lot of credit to open source as in is just the fact that we are self hosting all these you know from venus back office platforms to our supporting tickets to everything is 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 just open source or it's the way we have hosted it as well because i'm guessing it's also the server cost and all would rack up even if you use open source yeah o- open source technologies if you self host you're not vendor locked in and you don't nobody can rent seek from you but doesn't matter what technologies you pick your stack is only as good as how you engineered it so we put in significant amounts of time effort and thought into engineering and making all systems as efficient as possible so uh, even if it used i mean open source is a given any large tech company today smaller large everybody is running on open source stacks nobody really talks about it so it's we we've, we've had a singular focus to make our tech as resource light and as efficient as optimal as possible everything from our uh, front facing investment and trading platforms to our back office systems just last month we had i think the 6th or 7th rewrite of one of those back office processes where every night it would take uh, i think 40 50 minutes now it takes 4 4 minutes so we found a new piece of technology that's emerged and we rewrote that stack so we've done this exercise so many times pause to reduce technical debt we've rewritten some of our systems really half a dozen times most organizations don't really tend to look at it that way so it's really the engineering philosophy uh, of doing tech the right way thinking about the next 5 years or 10 years even uh, kind of being as less wrong as possible and that's what that is what has enabled all of this you're absolutely right we even recently did a simple quantification exercise of comparing saas paid saas alternatives to all the systems that we self host and we figured that uh, just the cost we are saving on not using saas platforms for all our systems saves us significant amounts of money probably 2 digit percent of our 
profitability. Then the lean systems that we run contribute another significant percentage to our, uh, towards our profitability. So this is so obvious to me that if you build your tech a little slowly in the initial phases, that's absolutely okay because it'll pay off five or 10 years from now. But if you go, if you add all the bloat, engineering bloat in the very beginning, you can never get out of it. And, and, and you know, coming back to Nikhil's investor shoes point, yeah. this, do you think it, you know, if the business was setting revenue goals and targets, like we have never set one as a business till date. Yeah. If we did, do you think we would have had to compromise on some of these things? As in like, we would have Absolutely. had to go to SaaS and... We would also have had to compromise on people. Like, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, seriously though. So right. We've set up our... We've hired for a certain kind of philosophy. I think most people who've been hired with that framework wouldn't have been able to survive in such an environment. So we've, these are all factors of selection. And arbitrary... Revenue deadlines are, sorry, revenue goals are so arbitrary. Who says that you have to make X percent every three months? How does that even work in the real world, especially in something like capital markets where, like you said, everything is absolutely unpredictable. So I think any sort of a revenue target would have been absolutely absurd. And the moment you set such a target, everybody is scrambling, looking for artificial pathways to push towards that number that's just been made up, out, you know, made out of uh, nothing. So... We wouldn't have existed for sure. And, and we you know, on the on the business side, you know, we have never had sales targets or you know, revenue targets, etc. Do you think on business support because you interact with everyone on the team, does do people feel there is a good? You know, I mean, this philosophy is rubbed up there as well as in the sense people feel more content and you know get up every day and wanting to work because we are not forcing down targets. Absolutely, as K said. If there were revenue targets, you would be forced to do things that you wouldn't have done in the natural course of, of your behavior. Yeah. So I think definitely is, is a big plus because everyone who's working is only thinking of how do you better the experience for the end user. I think with this philosophy, it, it, it works. First thing on, on open source, were you like, you know, this is like, it's so funny that not once we have discussed if varsity should be behind a login. Like, you know, like, uh, mm -hmm. I was thinking about this when we were writing down, that it was understood, like, you know, it was almost understood that everything that we'll do in varsity will be free for all, we will not advertise, we will, mm -hmm. you know, we'll put, you know, we'll answer people's query without asking if he's our customer. I don't know how many millions of people have registered, not once have we sent an email asking mm -hmm. them to open an account. I was thinking that we had discussed about this, right? And then I realized that we have never, yeah. ever discussed. <laughs> Yeah, we've not discussed, but the thought has always been this. I mean, if yeah. we are trying to, if the intent is to educate people, then that should be the only focus. Why even think about things like having a login, having a registration, and uh, all those things which are not relevant to education, right? So so I think it just came in naturally. Right. No, but like in your previous avatar, before Zero, though, like, you know, I know you're writing, cont were you like this that time also? Or no. was? You know, oh. <laughs> I was. I wanted to know who was registering for the course, and I always wanted to know what can I sell next. And I thought I knew him. <laughs> no, but uh, but I think these thoughts evolved. Right. right. So and sure. Also, you know, like a lot of people, you know, like I think for Nikhil and Karthik especially, right? As in, this keeps coming. I want to trade. Is there can Varsity put up some content that can? you know, somehow help me trade very well, you know. And so it's a, trade for a living. Guy. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, like everyone's looking for hope. So there's a lot of question around that. You know, maybe, you know, you can add. See, everything related to markets, trading and investing is already there. But I wouldn't encourage anyone to consider trading for a living. Assuming that, uh, you know, people who are looking at this are people with families earning, uh, who have bills to pay. And they're all normal people, not, not uh, you know, uh, someone who has uh, a one crore or one and a half crore capital, right? So I wouldn't advise uh, people to consider think of trading full time to sustain their their lives. That I have a steady source of income, non volatile source of income. 
and then use trading to you know leverage or add that extra component to your income uh, but investing i think everybody should do you are right and and what would you say is the right way to invest just do mutual fund as an index i think mutual fund is a no brainer i'm right. not saying because we have if <laughs> you think but but it's a no brainer it's it's uh, it's what yeah. it's a beautiful product i think everybody should have an yeah, exposure right. i think you should spell out the disclaimer yeah mutual fund <laughs> investment yeah, is subject, subject to market, to market risk, risk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so you now we can put it at the bottom you know but yeah so uh Like, Venu being compliant guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, look here on trading itself. How much of it is strategy, which is you know like a strategy which gives you, which tells you when to buy sell, and how much of it is about just how you handle your emotions under fear and greed? As in, like, what makes a good trader? As in, the realization that there are no strategies first. I think. <laughs> Everything works for a certain amount of time until it does not work, mm. and more often than not, it takes away all you gained before it stops working. So, uh, running strategies, copying strategies, or implementing what somebody else has done well through, I don't think will work. Uh, emotion i think controlling it helps to a large extent uh, but at the core of it i i guess you have to find a sector which has tailwind you have to figure out a larger theme you believe in if you're bullish on consumption in india if your bet is that indian gdp per capita will go from 2000 to 5000 dollars you have to make an assumption like that i think that's step one I think once you make that assumption, you go to step two, thinking which sector will benefit most from that. Then you make that assumption, and then you go to step three and think which company in that sector will do well. No, but this is more investing. What would you say to people who are trying to day trade? And I'm I'm on the verge of my transition from trading to investing. I'm getting to that point where there is no trading, and now I'm more a full time investor. But uh no, but, but the same logic huh? the give... same logic works for trading as as does for investing i think uh but your time is have... shrunk yeah it's okay you can keep rolling forward right like say you you're somebody who's trying to do pair trading you arrive at the sector which you think you're bullish about let me say if you look at consumption in india right now uh strangely the numbers are looking really bad this quarter compared to two quarters ago amazon's rate of growth in india is about 5% flipkart is about 7-8% flipkart does better because they do high end electronics uh fashion has slowed down to sub 10% uh electric vehicles vehicles are slowing down but in just all that i said now i said high end mobile phones and tvs and domestic production and manufacturing is growing fastest so you would buy that and you would short something which is not growing maybe old school it services because of intrinsic threats to that sector uh, but going through step 1 step 2 step 3 the three assumptions you make probably help you pick which trades you should make at the bottom no but you are also a, an amazing day trader so i mean Like you can't get away. I mean, what does no. it take to be be a good day trader? As in, no, to be able I, to trade with leverage and all of that. I mean, I'm saying, what should is there like a skill set someone can help and all kind of try working to get to help someone become a good day trader? No, because the thing about day trading is it's just crazy how many people out there sell the idea that they will teach you to become a day trader. I mean, the yeah. question is, is there is it is it really think, possible? I think learn learning from someone else is less likely than learning from your experiences. What is probably a good teacher more than what is available in the market is screwing up many times, losing the money, but losing small amounts of money. Uh I wouldn't recommend for anyone to go to a day trading course and pay mad amounts of money. <laughs> uh if not for any other reason if that person teaching you could make so much money he wouldn't be there teaching yeah. you so uh, would definitely advise against that uh but i would say also being 
uh, this is the op- opposite of euphemism. What what is the opposite of euphemism? This is sounding like uh, you know exaggerating the abilities of a day trader, but uh, I think being a day trader is like being someone in a creative industry where it becomes hard to narrow down as to why A, B, C, D, or E works for a certain artist. Uh, but like I said, I think it's a product of your evolution, the mistakes you made, and the lessons that you derived from the mistakes you made. And you have to make the mistakes. That is like going to college. Going to somebody and paying them money to teach you to be a day trader is probably not a good idea. Just to add to that, um, to his question. So, according to you, what sort of emotional quotient the person should have to be a successful day trader? You should be emotionally dead. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like you should not feel happy when you make money. You should not feel sad when you lose. So money. basically, dispassionate towards uh, your PNL. Yeah. The day you start to evolve as a trader is when you come to terms with the fact that nobody knows what will happen tomorrow, and you can't model for tomorrow. Then you start looking at. Okay, these are one of five scenarios that can occur tomorrow. Either the market can fall 5%, go up 5%, fall 1%, go up 1%, or nothing can happen. Then you figure out what position would you like to be sitting on if any of these events occur. But you have historical data and you have experience and time spent in the market, which give you a vague idea of how often any of these events occur. Uh... Also, in my experience, most often nothing happens in the market, right? Uh, so you would probably be profitable longer and smaller if you bet on nothing happening versus trying to pick, pick a direction. Uh, uh, so many tiny things like this, I would say two percent is what I said. Ninety-eight percent is what you will learn on your own. Uh, a combination of that mixed with a lot of luck will help. You survive for longer, and even though I've been doing it for almost twenty years, I I feel like I have been lucky in my own way because the cycle in the last twenty years, competition with other traders was not as hard, not as tough. People were not as evolved as they are today. Uh, so for the person who has to thrive in the next twenty, the learnings will have to be something else altogether. Likely won't be me; it'll be someone else. But they will have to figure out from their own experiences what they learn. You know, I mean, like this whole you know emotionally dead. You know, I had this question. No, because this is something I have. Like, I think one of the ways I've run the business as well is this whole trying to make peace with the worst case outcome before everything. Now, the I think it's it's very similar to what Nikhil was saying. Uh, so, in a way. Before you do anything, you're saying, "Oh, what's the worst that can happen? Let me make peace with it." You're a super emotional person. <laughs> I'm, 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 <laughs> no, but I'm saying. Who are you kidding? <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah. No, it's I, not. It's yeah. not about emotional. I'm yeah. saying uh, the other problem with me is, uh, it is. Uh, I'm trying to make peace with everything, right? Like if I'm walking the street, I'm like, "Well, something happened, not happened." <laughs> so almost every time something bad happens, I've already factored in. So I am unable to react to it. So, uh, like a quick one, as in, where do you think, at least in in the broking industry and capital markets and trading, where do you think the first disruption from AI? I mean, disruption is a probably, you know, like a big word to use, but you know, where could be the first impact of AI in our, you know, in the in the life of capital market? I've I've been at a loss uh, thinking about this. about disruption in capital markets he'd have a better picture and i i have a feeling that any sort of technology that is assimilated into the markets will just get normalized that's how markets always work ai or not but uh, from a product stock broker perspective honestly i mean we talk about this all the time right what is that what could be that one big thing thing from that that comes from the ai realm that helps customers uh significantly or changes something with how people interact with the markets and i don't think there there's going to be one big thing i think it'll be many little things increment uh small little uh, incremental things that 
slowly creep in. Good. I and, just and, can't foresee any can big disruptions. Can I ask you a question around this? Yeah. Has anything changed drastically in the world of AI in the last 24 months? <laughs> oh yeah, significantly. Which is? So the proliferation of some of these very sophisticated large language models, LLMs, you know, GPTs, uh, these things behave, I'm using the word behave very carefully. They've been exhibiting utility that previous generation of technologies have never been able to. So I'll give you one simple example from my daily life. I use a search engine. My usage of a search engine, I think, has dropped probably 95%. And that has completely changed the way I seek answers for technical stuff, non-technical stuff. I know that these models are not factual. But let's say 97% of all my tech queries mm -hmm. now go to an LLM. I get an instant answer, which, which is contextual. One? I use GPT-4. So that has never ever happened before. And, and how much time has it saved to complete a task that you might have taken X amount of time in your normal life? Sometimes, so typically I end up on a search engine, let's say Google or Kagi, which I use. I'm there because I've exhausted uh, whatever I know. So it's going to be a, these are tricky problems. And typically you go, the search cycle is you go click through a bunch of links, read questions, answers. Uh, let's say typically you spend 30, 40 minutes. And these are annoying queries. Now I go ask that same question to GPT-4, I get an answer within 15 seconds. Uh, or if the answer doesn't work, I prod it a bit and I get an answer in uh, two, three minutes. So the difference has been stark. Uh, I'm saving perhaps 45 minutes per technical query that would have taken me so much time. And that's just finding answers. I think stuff has changed significantly. We can, I, I, I find the debates out there about the efficacy of GPT-4 in emulating human behavior to be, at, we need those discussions, but that's separate. But it's actual tangible in, implications, whether it has the ability to think or not, irrespective of all of that, is significant. And we're seeing it, all of us. Okay, do you voluntarily resist using a chat GPT-4 because it will hinder your intellectual capabilities? Have you ever? No, I think it helps me focus on solving the problem far better, saving 45 minutes. So I think uh, maybe it's because I've been writing code for like 23 years. But a beginner is it's different, like you said, with trading also, right? A beginner, somebody who's learning to code, if they become dependent heavily on a system that just gives you solutions that might significantly impede your ability to learn. You have to make those mistakes, otherwise you can't learn how to write software. But for experienced people, uh, uh, it's it's a huge productivity boost and it only help you improve things, save a lot of time so no, that you can no, focus on what matters. The question on this, you know, uh, even first, I, I've been writing blogs for so long and even and now I'm addicted to it. Like I need like Grammarly or whatever, right? Is in the sense, like I have a feeling that I'm losing my writing skills because of this, right? Because without it, I can't seem to work now. You know, I need it to suggest, you know, I'm GPT or Grammarly? Grammarly, but it's it's kind of very similar. It's getting smarter by the yeah, day. Yeah. Grammarly has that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's kind of auto-suggesting. It's making you, I mean, yeah. so now, you know, over time, how do you think about this, about this philosophically? As in, do you think humankind will be lose their skill sets over time because, I mean, I'm saying someone like you has experienced and done this, but for most people, they'll probably take the easy way out and... Uh... Very difficult to answer this question, but if you think about writing skills, uh, how many people have had good writing skills? It's a largely recent phenomenon, maybe half century or slightly more. Before that, most of humanity didn't have good writing skills or even reading skills, right? So when we say, where will humanity go? We're only looking at a small, really small window. Also, language has changed so many times. Yeah, language keeps on evolving. Uh, that said, I don't use any of these tools when I'm writing. I'd like to make those little mistakes and proofread it. So even for proofreading, I don't use any of these tools. For yeah. code, I do because I'm trying to solve a narrow problem and I want it solved fast. But when I'm writing language, I don't even use Grammarly. And, and uh, AI is causing so much anxiety, right? We know, I mean, like what we are communicating within the, like, you know, as a business, within the team, 
Do you think it's helping that saying that just because we could automate a process, we are not going to let people go? I mean, like because you you speak to you know the. So I think to begin with, we're not overstaffed. So we have uh, the number of people that are required to cater to whatever role that there is. Even if there was AI, I think there's still a human element to broking, uh, which I think you can't do away with. So with the limited number of people that we have, I think there's a sense of solace that AI is not going to take away the jobs with the promise that we've made that it will not. Right. And, yeah. and Karthik, I mean, do you think AI in trading, because there is so many new tools and platforms claiming that there's a magical way to make money now trading using AI, and a lot of people are you know, peddling random stuff. I mean, just uh, this morning, someone had asked me this query: uh, Can AI help me in investing? I think investing, in particular, is more of a mindset. You know, you need to develop a long-term mindset for investing. I don't think so. An AI can help you solve for that. For the mindset problem. For the mindset problem, maybe it can help you uh, filter through the tracking universe and giving you a short, you know, smaller set of stocks <coughs> to focus on. But beyond that, to be successful, I think it's more of a mindset. Um, we'd right. like to hear your yeah. views on that. Yeah. I think AI is like religion, like cryptocurrencies are the religion. <laughs> if there are enough adopters who use AI to define how they will trade, then AI will work in trading. Right. Could yeah. you explain that? Yeah, so uh, human sentiment which mandates or which brings out the price of a certain asset class cannot be modeled for. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm buying a certain stock and he's selling and you're buying and he's selling and Pelo's buying, I don't think there is any way to model for how we will behave when we will buy, when we will sell. But if I start using AI to make my buying decisions and you start using AI to make your selling decisions, if enough adopters exist to make it like a religion, then AI will become a self-fulfilling prophecy which will also work in trading. But in a sense, what you're talking about is also this is the systematic way of... I mean, everyone uh, following moving averages to... That is a religion. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a religion. But this yeah. is how algos already work, right? right? Algos compete yeah. with if each other. If there are en enough adopters who adopt any one thing, this is the whole cryptocurrency world as well, in my opinion. Hmm. If you have enough adopters to make a certain thing a religion, if we find that for AI in trading, then AI will work. Hmm. If we don't and we all continue to believe that K will buy when <laughs> he, has had a fought, he has had a fight with Deepa in the morning or sell, <laughs> like, <laughs> then there's no way for it to work. <laughs> You see who's bullying who. Right? <laughs> this is like my 45 minutes where I have some respite from the lifelong bullying which is coming from that direction. Like someone was saying that we all look quite fit. Uh, and we do, I think, you know, I think we I think we should take great pride. I think the core team is, maybe we are one of the fittest core teams. What about K? So K is, I mean, he's flexible. He's, he's not healthy. working out. Yeah, but he walks I walk quite a bit. And I, I eat think he's very food. conscious in his diet. Yeah. Decent food, walk. But I need to exercise more. Yeah. So quickly, as in, you know, philosophically, like how do we think of health and fitness individually? Maybe when you can start, you're the fittest in the room right now. No, I don't know if I'm the fittest, but you've put me in a spot and I am now having to up my game just to stay. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, you put my face out on social media saying this dude is fit. So, so just that. <laughs> I think I, yeah, no, I think one of those hacks in life is is you know the thing about health and fitness is also I think building some accountability, right? Yeah. As in if you if you're accountable to someone else, your odds of staying healthy and you know yeah. is yeah. Yeah. But yeah, sorry. So I don't know. I, uh, fitness, health, I mean these are nice words to use, but then when we were kids growing up, the only thing that I would know is to go out and play. I mean so that tendency sort of evolved and I've never been overweight. I don't think I've ever been overweight in my life. And it's just that. It's just a natural progression of how I was as a child to wherever it is now. And today I can feel nice about it when I see uh, my college mates who are, who are uh, married, have one kids who look, uh, you know, 
10 20 years older than i am so now it's a, it's a do, marketing do you, do you think it is also got to the, do the fact that all of Absolutely. us 100% yeah. is yeah. that right. at least for me yeah. yeah so it's just that we keep talking about all of this we talk about protein how many peanuts i eat i think this must have come <laughs> among its this stuff when we discuss so yeah i, th I think it's a it's a thing when we just keep discussing about these things. So it's it gets ingrained in your mind. So even when I'm looking at a certain something, I'm not not naturally inclined to eat that because I know there's a big group to which I'm accountable <laughs> in a certain way. Yeah. So it's just, uh, yeah. Well, how, what, how do you think about health? I mean, I think you, um, I mean, you actually enjoy your workout. You know? I mean, you, in yeah. a sense, you go chill in the gym. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yeah, it's, it's workout more like... Workout for me is like therapy. Like a podcast. So I go to the gym at night when nobody's there. I really enjoy uh, my trainer's company, Shodan, who's been with me for a long time. And uh, we talk to each other. And I, I live a fairly isolated life, right? Like, Shodan is my human interaction for the day. Like, in-person human interaction. <laughs> <laughs> so we talk for an hour. And mm -hmm. I've come to the realization that Workout plays such a small role in being fit. For me, the problem is sleep. I don't think food is a problem, diet is okay, all of that is fine. No, but this diet, what did you... I remember you not being this disciplined. What has changed over the last two, three years? Huh? Like, I think big thing is intermittent fasting. I feel like it's the easiest thing to do. So I eat dinner by 8, 9 p.m. And I don't eat up until... 12 or 1 in the afternoon. It's a very easy change to make. I have two black coffees in the morning before lunch. Uh, and I've never really had a sweet tooth or anything. Yeah, No, but eating was, you know, we used to eat quite... When we were kids, we ate what we had access to. Right. <laughs> right? You all. Karthik? Yeah, I think for me, um, thanks to all the conversations that we keep having, having in office, so that's rubbed off heavily. Uh, on me and uh, I've started uh, looking into health and fitness more seriously now. Uh, I uh, I again work out in the morning, uh, have a trainer who comes in and uh, just I think one of the best investments I've made is uh, investing in a small home gym setup and having a personal trainer with me. Uh, he shows up every day and, uh, you know, Accountability. I'm, and, and I'm accountable uh, for his time, yeah. his efforts that he's spending on me. Mm. Uh, and my general philosophy is to age strongly. Right? So retain nice. muscles and age mm. strongly. And I'm working towards that. Okay. He works out for one hour anyways, right? Sorry? K works out for one hour anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't like... I just can't... I really don't like exercising in a gym, gym or doing exercise for the sake of exercising, but I love walking. I can walk 10, 15 kilometers. And uh, food, I'm conscious, portion size, don't eat junk. I haven't gave up sugar in tea, coffee, etc. like 10 years ago. Just reasonably healthy diet. You yeah, know, I think, you know, lots like, of movement. Usually, you know, like uh, some of the people in the office when they ask, you know, like why like I care about you know, taking my heart rate to 160, 170, etc. And I, I say that not everyone needs to be. I enjoy that. Yeah, yeah. Right? But I was I was just explaining to someone saying that, you know, just controlling your food, like what yeah. Nikhil was saying, you know, that workout is really a small portion of overall health and well-being. Yeah. And it's probably more got to do with what you eat yeah. and how you sleep. And I think you are like a prime example of how just eating in moderation, right? As in, I remember when you guys... When you joined him to the gym in like three months, you had full muscle and all of that, right? And he was showing me the photo recently, and he had like, you know, all know, pecs and all of that. You know, so on on gold, uh, what do you, what is your view on gold? Because gold and real estate, I know I know your view, but maybe since like all of us, I, know, I mean, do you have a view on gold and real estate? I just have some SGVs. I don't have <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So gold as an asset class, I like personally. So I've bought a fair amount. Uh, historically, inversely proportional to, uh, I would say, how well stock markets do. That correlation has kind of gone away. Right now, in the last cycle, stock markets and gold kind of did well together. Uh, 
I like gold because in a world which is warring over share of world trade and maybe there is a transition that happens from one geography to another in such a situation of uncertainty having an asset which has thousands of years of history is probably prudent in everyone's portfolio and hence I hold it uh as an indian uh, we don't have any gold we import everything it's half a trillion dollars of fiscal hit on our uh, numbers as a country so if you're buying please buy fgb you have a 2.5% kicker on top of it which is you know and and real estate i mean well real estate is interesting i feel like uh, uh i had a overtly critical outlook of real estate for a long long time uh it is the largest asset class on the planet and to have zero exposure to real estate like i did you know we did for the longest time was not the smartest thing in the world i don't think you can be a asset allocator and have zero exposure to the largest asset class that being said there are many headwinds uh, the the path forward for india in my opinion is not necessarily what happened in china uh, i feel urbanization worked there for a different reason urbanization might not be the way forward here uh, the demographics are changing across the world people are having fewer kids older people require lesser real estate than younger people uh that's a trend which is very visible in places like japan in india commercial yields are 6% residential are 3% uh the arbitrage between buying and renting is so wide that i still find it hard to convince my own head to buy a home if i can rent a home uh, for that reason but well i might be wrong but i think to me personally bad choice not to ever have bought any real estate uh can i make up my mind buying real estate at the frothy valuations to, of today probably not the one big thing like i think should change in this world is we need property taxes there is so much black money and leakage in our country which goes and finds its way into property uh there is plenty of precedent for property taxes across the world uh you could go to like connecticut in us the number is as high as 1 and 1/2 2% to mitigate this so black 1 and 1/2% per year right of the value of the property yeah, yeah it's crazy wow. so <laughs> if we had to mitigate the black money problem in india and the cash economy to a large extent i think implementing property prices is a great way because if you have more property you have more black money you pay more tax and it's realized on an annual basis in in a way the way indian government is trying to go indirect taxes this might actually be in sync with the i think so i think property taxes and inheritance taxes together will make the economy a lot more round yeah. so a couple of last points i mean the last serious topic is around risks i think uh, this is something in our business uh, like very under appreciated fact is how much risk we take like you know every night when i'm sleeping i think mm-hmm. what if there is you know like i don't know north korea presses a button or someone else presses a red button and there is a because you know you come back up tomorrow morning you you uh you know we, we are i think what people don't realize is we are also like a insurance business we keep eating small amounts of premium but every once in a while there potentially could be a large event that can take away a lot of money that you made right so every night there is a risk uh, you know and it's a risk for every stock broker in the world um uh, there is a tech risk like one of the questions that i've come across you know which maybe you can start with that actually now that i'm saying tech risk which is around like how do you think about the risk tech risk being the largest broker in this country i mean it's immense and if we truly if we have if we all had the actual risk quantified as something in our hands i don't think we'll ever be able to sleep any of us <laughs> so it's literally that being a large organization you already have a massive target 
on your back. Forget financial. If you're online and you're big, now imagine a financial organization that is big and popular, right? You naturally get a hu humongous bullseye painted on your back. So cyber security is just one thing, but running these systems day in, day out, forever, I mean, don't we have to run this forever <laughs> for the next century <laughs> if we manage to get there? Uh, so that thought, right? And I think we've all internalized this, right? Uh, but I have a... I have a, I've been having this fundamental thought. So tech risk, uptime, downtime, let's say cybersecurity, these things have only become like a big deal in society in the last 10 or 15 years. But we've all digitized. When I say we, humanity as a whole has, we've all digitized rapidly. But we've never, never before in history have we digitized, right? And the entire society now runs on digital systems. And we're having conversations like this, what is risk? We don't know what risk will look like in 10, 15, or 20, or 25 years, right? How this stuff will evolve, not just Zerodas tech, generally complex tech, complex societies, all interconnected systems. I have no idea. Uh, there's no, this has never happened in history. Actually, that's, that's quite crazy, right? The fact that for thousands of years, nothing happened, and then the whole civilization—I mean, the whole planet—got digitized in like 15 years, practically. Right. And now we are building entire humanity's future. Forget financial; absolutely everything on digital system software, which is just 15 year, years of practical experience, right? So when we speak of risk, this risk has been worrying me a lot more because nobody knows tomorrow how everything will evolve, and we know that. Even regulations have been forcing us to be more and more connected and integrated with so many other systems, right? The regulators also now think digitally. Every new regulation now in incorporates a large digital system inside the stack. Where will all of this go in the next 10 or 15 years? So that risk, that civilizational risk of technology, I have, it's, it's like a complete black box. I don't think anybody can predict. And imagine the Zerodha stack five years ago, how different it looks today, right? And that's happened in five years. So there's that, but apart from that, the daily risk of running this is absolutely immense. Uh, and we've, over a period of time, evolved philosophies and processes and engineering practices that minimize the potential for bad stuff happening. That also I'd like to add to your previous question, like can someone just do this overnight? These are the risks. Such complex, massive, complex systems that carry so much financial risk can't be built overnight. They shouldn't be built overnight. Yeah. So if you try to build all of this, let's say whatever we built in like a year or two, you compress all this complexity and learnings into two years and get people to just write software, you that's not... Compromise on yeah, risk. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think we were talking earlier is, you know, like about scaling that we spoke earlier, right? As in, I think even not just as business risk, even as tech risk, it goes up significantly if you scale very quickly, especially in a regulated kind of... Exponentially. Right. And like you say, derivatives have infinite risk, and right. that's a side effect of a tech defect, right? Yeah. And we don't know, on, in terms of regulations itself, uh, while they've been really hard on us to make those changes, but do you think life has gotten better? Like today, if you were to look back on time and say, you know, the last three years, the regulatory changes have been, I don't know, 10x of the previous eight years. So, but today, do you think it's easier as a business? I mean, you know, life has become easier. These, all these regulatory changes, has it reduced risk in the system? And has life become easier? I mean, how do you think of it? I would assume so. Otherwise, Sebi wouldn't be so, so reactive to whatever has happened. Has life become easier? It certainly has. I mean, while all of us have cribbed about regulations that have uh, been introduced, uh, we've created a fuss about why there was a need to bring in these regulations because there are only a handful of rotten apples and the entire industry uh, has to take the cover for it. But I think in the long run, it is, it, it's definitely made our life uh, easier. Uh, but again, is this going to hamper business like regulations like tomorrow if Sevi were to come and say uh, a broker can't collect funds uh, from an end user, right? I mean, we all have to adopt to an as per. Now that that could have that could lead to other forms of risks to the yeah. business, right? So, sure. Nikhil, how, how do you look at risk as in you know with a 
open portfolio at every time. Yeah. Like, and you know, considering That's... we are generally, you know, all of us are more pessimistic. I don't know. I mean, you're also quite pessimistic about future, I'm guessing, or like about? You, uh, about future. I mean, where do you future put Future of what? Future of, you know, the next five, 10 years. I'm, I'm of stock markets, of yeah, life. Yeah. Of, of... Oh, no, of, I mean, <laughs> of stock markets, yeah. I mean, in the sense, you know, we, uh, no, actually, you're more optimist than a pessimist, I think. You know, I'm saying, you know, how do you think about, you know, having a large investment portfolio every night when you sleep? Do you think that tomorrow morning I get up and... Markets go down. Just the no, markets collapse forever. In a sense, you know, you see, we've had, you know, we're lucky that the last yeah. 20 years of our existence in the stock markets in India have been a bull market, right? But there is no guarantee that it will be like that in the future. So, like, uh, what if, you know, what happened in Japan, right? I mean, it took like, I don't know, 30 years to get back to their... Previous, previous yeah. So have you, have, have you thought about it? Yeah, I mean, evidently I think about it every day. <laughs> at the end of each day. Uh -huh. uh, maybe the only consolation to my own insecurities around this uh, are creating ways and means of remaining relevant from an intellectual standpoint to be able to recreate something else in the future. I think all of what we have built, all of what we've achieved, uh, if we hold it more closely to our heart, then we should. Uh, I think it's just asking for trouble. You know, every, anything can change at any point of time. Tomorrow markets fall 20%. Uh, every bank, every mutual fund, every stockbroker, every trader, every investor, everybody will get screwed in the process. I think you have to, as an individual, continue to back yourself and continue to evolve and change and learn so you remain relevant day after tomorrow. But I do worry about it and I think... Uh, Khatak, you you've done, your, your master's was in risk, is it? Risk and asset management, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> what about what you've learned there have you implemented in your personal life? You know, and I say risk more as a, you know, as a family man with two kids, wife. How do you think about, like, you know, maybe your, you know, your advice to people like, you know, who are in similar, who got a family, who got a job, who got two kids, you know, you have to worry about education, etc. How do you think about risk? Can I say something in between? You know what Jung says? Worry is in your control, sorrow is not. What will happen tomorrow is going to happen any which ways. The effect or impact on that your life is probably 3 out of 10. If you're going to worry about that risk to an event you can't predict, you can't control, you can't foresee, you can't fathom, this is more looking at you when I say this answer. <laughs> but... If you're going to make that 3 out of 10 into 7 out of 10, 8 out of 10, it's probably net, net, not productive for your well-being. Yeah, no, but I think you still have to do a basic common sense. Like you yeah. have to follow a certain, out of certain, 10. Yeah, certain framework. You I have to worry about 3 out of 10. Some sort of safety nets. Uh, like usually, you know, like how do you think of it? How many months of, like, you know, you since you've changed, you've done jobs before, you've done business, etc. Like... What is what do you think is the right kind of liquidity? Like, you know, how much should people See, sit there on? There is no one answer that fits all families here. Each family is different. Uh, each person is different. I think that's why the whole thing is called personal finance, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the good thing for anyone to do here is to, re you know, realistically assess what would be your, let's say, eight or ten months or one year expense and safeguard that in a in something like a gold or a liquid fund or whatever and just stash it away and, and don't tap into that as a as a source of income or as a source of you know funding for your other aspirations in life so i think this has to be worked out by sitting with, with your family members your your better up and then and then arriving at a number and so, then, but there is no fixed formula as such so so Assuming at least the base is 8 to 12 months of... At least. So I, I hate to put a number there right. because it varies for each family. But as a thumb rule, I think that's, that's that it. should and, be the... And have a health insurance policy, term insurance course. policy. Of course. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I think all personal finance journey should start with insurance. ensuring you have a insurance in place, health and term, and then an emergency corpus. 
and then start looking into everything else maybe equity you know, equities yeah. and stuff sweet uh, last two questions uh, book recommendations you know like a bunch of them i've asked uh, book podcast whatever as in uh, i mean i i'll go i mean i'm in love with uh, acquired <laughs> you know business yeah. podcast and empire uh, you know k introduced me to uh, the anarchy by william dalimple and i was i i was blown over just reading about east india company and all of that and empire is just an extension of that uh, just i think knowing history just adds so much more meaning like you know you get more context about everything that's happening around you so yeah. so yeah so those two from my side k maybe you can go like this very similar i always cite this one book that had a significant impact on me phantoms in the brain simple to understand neuroscience book that really made me reval reevaluate my idea of being myself or being a human and then like we keep discussing i really like reading history all kinds of history biographies autobiographies historical descriptions and i know it sounds a little cliche but understanding history really helps you even make software better uh, a lot of software product design comes down to psychology so if you when you have historical context of how people have really behaved how people think you realize that there are certain universal principles that never changed i think reading a lot of history helps in designing better software for humans as well so lots of history books yeah i think the two books uh, i mean apart from varsity <laughs> <laughs> yeah i won't recommend varsity so <laughs> apart from varsity i think um, i really like this book called uh, when the genius failed we were talking about risk earlier so that book is a beautiful uh, you know um, narrative of uh, what really happened with ltcm right? and it's so well uh, you know written roger lewis stein i think right so that's that's a book that anybody interested in finance market risk in general should read uh, apart from that um, i also like this book called uh, how do you measure your life by uh, Clayton Christensen, if I'm not wrong, uh, the book is beautiful in terms of uh, helping you devise small little strategies uh, to make peace. Right. So self-help yeah. book. It's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would. You read that book and you know. Okay. But it I mean. sounds like you came prepared with those two books. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, these, these two books. These two books. Even I already recounted the authors. <laughs> I all. I mean, I talk about these books quite often. So. Yeah. yeah. No, I I don't have any recommendations. I'm very restless to sit in one place and read anything. But I think book reading is very important. I mean, I've seen <laughs> how Nikhil's <laughs> intellectual capabilities have grown from you know the, the I mean even on the podcast the way he spoke so deep. <laughs> yeah, but I, but I don't have it. No, but I'll I'll tell you, you know, I think a trick uh, to get because I've always been like that, right? As in uh, maybe Nikhil also was like that for a long time. I think it's about finding a hook as in finding something that you are most interested about and starting reading there right versus trying to you know you know pick up right. just because he said or he said i am saying it's about picking up what you love most it could be cars it could be watches right because then you know you read you read about watch then you suddenly you'll go to steel or you'll go to you know like you'll just extend from there i think Uh, I think both of us, you know, in a way, like Nikhil also. I mean, we didn't study. I think for a long my, period of time. My trigger to read books was stop when I stopped going to school because I was insecure. My friends are going to school; <laughs> <laughs> they're all reading, so I would read whatever I could get my hands on. Yeah, yeah. but so when, I think. When, uh, huh? Sorry to interrupt, but uh, I saw this post, Tim Ferriss. I think one of the po- thing he spoke about is it's okay not to finish a book. <laughs> mm, yeah. So I think a lot of people have carry this guilt of starting to read. a book and leaving it half way yeah i mean because I they found I, it yeah, boring i mean i think uh, i if i can't survive one hour of a book yeah, i drop exactly. off exactly i have dropped off yeah. more books than i've read <laughs> i mean that is <laughs> for another reason i'm sure <laughs> but many yeah. books are just terribly written yeah. i agree yeah yeah i agree i think but the next time you do this you should ask everybody what books should you not read yeah. Yeah. but then you all will have cuz i feel i can like, take them so, to my mini library <laughs> show Yeah. No, but yeah, Yours. books. I like all books. Psychology of late. So everything, Jung, Adler, Freud, Jiddu, uh, similar schools of thought, but written in different manners. So all of their books. Right. 
So yeah, I mean, one last, if, if we had to give some advice to a young person, uh, what would it be? Can last question. Yeah. About? About life as in. Yeah. The thing is, it is one thing to say, this is wrong, that is wrong, that is wrong, but I don't know what is right. Like, I feel like uh, everything is relative. Everything is gray. Nothing is black and white, right? Like, not what we're doing, not what the next person is doing, not what the guy behind the camera is doing. I think realization of the fact that whatever we believe will be different from what we believe two years from now, different from what we believed five years ago, and knowing that everything, including thought, is transient is very important. Because then you don't hold on to anything so hard that you're not, you don't retain that ability to change. The only true realization in life is you're going to change what you believe in today, tomorrow, and then again day after tomorrow. So maybe not hold on to anything but, too tightly. But, but, I don't know. Um, I think never to chase outcomes. The outcome has always been more fruitful when you haven't uh, chased that outcome. And the other thing is probably to never perhaps live beyond your means. Yeah, live beyond your means is has to be yeah. like a golden rule for everyone. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, I don't know if I'm really qualified to give an advice. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 there is a butterfly flapping somewhere right. and it kind of helps you connect the dots at some point in life. So I think it's absolutely okay to do random things. Yeah. I resonate fully with Venu and, uh, uh, and Karthik and what Nikhil said, but in a slightly different sense, uh, which was virtue signaling, uh, absolutely agree. But I think the notion of winning in life what victory truly means, I think people have to, I mean, there's nothing new that I'm saying. People have been grappling with these issues for a very long time. What success truly means. So if you are chasing external outcomes as success, 99.99% of the people will be disappointed. So finding something that you like doing, be it building software, be it writing, be it reading or whatever, and then just refining it so that you, as long as you find true joy in it, I think that is a that's a better stress less way of existing than constantly chasing external outcomes with, which are not in our hands anyway. So in the process, you might become successful in whatever ways, but we should be chasing what we can do with our you know hands and mind. Really, I agree with you. I think my my point was more towards people who are successful and rich acting like it is good to be poor and bad. I mean, financially rich. successful, specifically. Yeah. In society. And I feel like they're just doing everybody a disservice by... Nobody's a saint. Everybody's <laughs> flawed. Don't <laughs> pretend to be one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... Yeah, I think if I were to add, adding to everyone else here, I think this being like a decent person is kind of underrated. It doesn't... <laughs> like, you know, like just a decent human being, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, you yeah. know, not wanting to get up and, you know, like squeeze yeah. your Please. competition. You know, as in, you know, I mean, you know, extract. try to extract as much as possible all the time. Uh, all of that is, uh, you know, I think it's oversold in MBA books. I think, uh, I think we can be decent human beings and still turn out all right, like yeah. we have as a business. So, so yeah. Uh, there was one more thing. Sorry, I interrupted. Yeah. Please finish. No, no, that's it. That's it. Yeah. I think uh, this, ironically, right, this whole thing about role models, and especially with social media, I think there are, there's just a proliferation of role models and professional role models. Just crap. Yeah, I mean, the whole, you know, the whole thing about influencers and whatnot, right? I think young people really need to look beyond role models. And you should pick up traits that you admire uh, from various people, but having role models, I mean, you keep saying never meet your role models, right? Uh, having excessive uh, admiration for role models, you know, from a, I don't know, maybe cult-like perspective 
is very detrimental and social media has just amplified that for millions and millions of young people. Wrong kinds of role models, wrong kinds of aspirations. So maybe don't really think very critically about role models in general. Hey, so, so yeah, no, this was a lot of fun. Uh, I mean, the first video is is from me hosting for the channel. Uh, I'm sure Karthik will do more. Venu will do more. I mean, Venu <laughs> has to do more. You know, K, we've been asking you know to do on tech. I think you know the world needs to hear a lot more about tech. Nikhil, anyways, is killing it on his podcast, so you can follow him on his channel. We'll get him to do a few, uh, maybe trading focused here, right? As in with traders, etc. So. I want uh, me and K will together do something. Yeah, I think you should. <laughs> you should yeah, yeah, you should. Yeah, you should. Uh, nice, Philosophical nice debates. Yeah, and hopefully our channel gets <laughs> you know, like a lot more. <laughs> Please don't say share, like subscribe. <laughs> no, 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 no,